The Brooklyn Nine, Fourth Inning, Chapter Three. It felt like the Pinkertons were out in full force the next day at the Brighton Beach Hotel. Walter wondered if the special attention was for him, but even as he thought it, he knew he was just being silly. Still, there had been a rash of hotel guests getting beat up. He smiled at the thought and ducked behind a trash can to avoid passing a security guard. Walter had hoped there would be a baseball game on the lawn this morning, but there was a band playing John Philip Sousa music there instead. That meant he was going to have to sneak into the hotel. But he and his family had stayed there last season, back when it was all right to look like a Jew, and he had a good idea of where the dining hall was. There were fewer places to hide in the halls and fewer avenues of escape, but he had to find Cyclone Joe. The dining hall was an enormous room with hundreds of long tables and huge chandeliers that sparkled in the late morning sunlight. Thousands of guests ate brunch, the noise from their chattering, like the hubbub at a ballpark. In between the tables, dozens of colored waiters moved in a complicated dance, delivering silver platters with the grace of a shortstop catching a ball and sideswiping second and throwing on to first. Walter realized someone had come up alongside him and he jumped, worried he'd been copped by a Pinkerton. Instead, it was just a colored waiter in a white service jacket. Can I help you find your party, young sir? Oh, I'm, I'm not with anyone here. I was actually looking for one of the waiters, Joe Williams, Cyclone. The colored man blinked and surprised. He looked like he might ask why, but swallowed his question and bid Walter follow him. They went through a set of double doors that led to a long hallway. Farther along, waiters came with empty platters and emerged with full ones. You wait right here, young sir, and I'll see if Cyclone is about. Walter waited for what felt like a long time, and when Cyclone Joe didn't appear, he snuck down the hall and peeked in through the round windows on the swinging doors. It was a vast kitchen, hazy with the smoke and steam of food being cooked for 5,000 people. Walter pushed his way inside. One or two of the colored cooks near the door gave him a second glance, but they were too busy to do anything about him being there. The stream of waiters coming in with new food orders was never ending, and Walter found a place in the corner out of the way of the constant traffic. Until he saw Cyclone Joe Williams come through the door. Walter jumped out at the big pitcher, who was so startled he juggled his tray. Luckily, it was empty. Dang, you like to scare the bejesus out of me, son. What are you doing here? I got you a tryout, Cyclone. I wired the manager of the Super Buzz on my parents' hotel account and got you a tryout with the team when they get back to Brooklyn this afternoon. It seemed like the entire kitchen got quiet all at once. Cooks and waiters all down the line stopped what they were doing and listened in on the conversation. Cyclone swallowed hard and Walter could feel everyone's eyes on them. I told you, kid, they ain't gonna let a Negro pitch the National League. They might if they don't know you're colored. Cyclone shook his head. Son, they ain't never going to believe I'm no Cuban. Not Cuban, Walter told him. Indian. You said yourself you're half Comanche, right? Cyclone glanced up at the kitchen staff. They were all still watching them. There's plenty of Indians that play in the National League, Walter told him. Bill File, Chief Bender, Zach Wheat. All we have to do is tell them you're Comanche and you can play. Cyclone didn't look sold on it. I don't know, kid. You're light-skinned enough, one of the kitchen boys told him. You might could pull it off. Can't hurt to try, said another. Not like they're going to lynch you right there in Washington Park, says you, said someone else. They can't say no, Walter told him. The super buzz, superb, the super buzz need you. The Brooklyn Cyclone, one of the other kitchen boys said appreciatively. All right, Cyclone said. What time? Walter left the kitchen on top of the world. That afternoon, he would deliver Cyclone Joe Williams to the Brooklyn Superbuzz. Not as Cyclone Joe Williams, of course, of course, but as Joseph Deerskin, Comanche Indian, and be a hero to an entire borough. With Cyclone Joe Williams as the team's ace pitcher, they might even challenge the Chicago Cubs for the National League pennant. Outside on the lawn, a blue baseball cap with a large letter B caught Walter's eye. It was his Brooklyn Superbuzz hat, and it was being worn by the boy who had taken it from him, the big ringleader who had called him a kike. Walter's fists clenched. The lawn was too open, too visible, and worse, the boy was walking with what looked like his parents. The weekend was almost over. When would Walter have another chance to get his hat back? 
And how could he show up at Washington Park today without it? Walter arranged himself on the path to meet the bully and his family face to face. The kids saw him coming a few yards away and grinned like Teddy Roosevelt. He thought he was safe next to his parents. Not that Walter thought he could take him in a straight fight anyway. The family walked up to Walter, who blocked their way. Oh, hello, the mother said. Are you a friend of Henry's? Henry snorted. No, Walter said, but he's been borrowing my hat. This ain't his hat, Henry started to tell his parents. That's when Walter popped him in the nose while he wasn't looking. Henry's mother let out a tiny scream as blood spurted from the boy's busted nose. Henry clutched his face wailing and Walter snatched the hat off his head before the boy's father could stir himself into action. Help, someone help, that boy just attacked my son. Walter heard the man cry. He was already off to the races though and the ladies and gentlemen out for their Sunday walks parted for him rather than try to stop him. At the last moment, a Pinkerton man appeared out of the crowd, but Walter slid around him like a runner avoiding a catcher's tag, tumbled another yard or so, and then picked himself back up to run before the detective could lay a hand on him. Laughing, he ran for the train station that would take him north to Park Slope and glory. The reaction to Joseph Deerskin was not what Walter had anticipated. The Brooklyn pitchers, the, book, the Brooklyn players made no move to welcome him to the clubhouse, standing stiff and staring at him like he was something poisonous. Old Patsy Donovan, the super buzz Irish manager and sometime right fielder, chomped on his cigar. Joseph Deerskin, eh? He said. Just wait till you see his Tommy Hawk pitch, Walter said. Cyclone glanced at him, but Walter focused on the manager. He knew he was the one he had to convince. Where'd you play last season, dear skin? Donovan asked. The San Antonio Black, Cyclone said, catching himself. The San Antonio Broncos, sir. San Antonio, eh? Down to Texas? You're a long way from home, laddie. One of the players gave a short, hard laugh. Donovan looked up at the team as if gauging him. I'm, so I'm sorry, he said. I'm sorry. We've no openings at pitcher this season, he said. But we need a pitcher, Walter argued. Last season, you brought in three new pitchers. How can there not be any room? Look here, lad. I know you. I took you on this bad boy because you came in here talking about King Kelly. Hell, because you even knew who King Kelly was. That means a lot to an old Irishman like me, but this. Don't worry yourself, Walter, Cyclone said. He nodded to Donovan. Thank you for your time, sir. No, wait, you've got to see him pitch, Mr. Donovan. He'd be the best pitcher in the National League. Behind him, one of the superba players coughed. We just don't have the money, Walter, Donovan told him. I'm sorry. No, let's see him pitch, one of the players said. George Walter turned. It was one of the boys from Georgia. I want to see his Tommy Hawk. Walter beamed. You won't be disappointed. I guarantee it. The team took the field at Washington Park for practice, splitting up to play an intra-squad game. It was a warm spring afternoon, the clouds high in the bright blue sky over the long, low grandstand behind home plate. Cyclone hung back before taking the field. They know, Walter, we ain't fooling anybody. I should just go. No, they're going to give you a tryout. When they see how good you are, they'll have to take you on the team. And you are Indian. That's not a lie. It ain't the whole truth, neither. Are we going to see some pitching today, or are you just going to stand around jawing with the bat boy? One of the players called from the field. Walter stepped back from the field, and Cyclone took the mound. The broad-shouldered giant worked the ball in his hands, then slipped on his glove and went into his windup. Fap! The ball smacked into the catcher's mitt as the first batter took a swing and a miss. Walter jumped and clapped, glancing around to see the team's reaction. Their faces were as stony as they were in the clubhouse, and he stopped cheering. Fap! Another fastball the batter couldn't catch up to. Walter had to keep himself from cheering. Cyclone kicked his leg for a third pitch and fired, but this time the batter turned his bat down and bunted the fastball into the ground in front of the plate. The catcher sprang from his crouch and pounced on the ball, then threw down to first and well over the first baseman, who didn't even try who didn't even jump to try and catch it. The ball went into right field, and the runner was on second before the ball made it back in to the pitcher. That's a two-base bunt, one of the players said. 
Walter didn't understand. That was no hit. It was an error, clear and simple. Cyclone took a deep breath on the mound and worked the ball over in his hands before pitching again. This time, the batter got a piece of it, knocking an easy ground ball to the shortstop, who let it go right between his legs. Walter was furious. It was a play any kid on any street in Brooklyn could have made with his eyes closed. The runner scored, and the hitter was safe at first. Cyclone struck out the next batter, despite his attempt to bunt, and struck out the next one looking. The following batter popped up into foul territory near Walter. He backed off as the first baseman came over to catch it, then stared open-mouthed as the usually sure-handed Superba let it drop. The first baseman stared back like Walter's father when Walter got in trouble at school for fighting, like he was disappointed. Suddenly, Walter understood what was happening. The Superbas weren't rusty. They were definitely misplaying the ball behind Cyclone. This was their way of saying they would never play with a colored man on the field. The Super Buzz booted over through and dropped ball after ball, and Cyclone endured seven unearned runs in the two innings he pitched. I think we've seen enough, Donovan said, and Cyclone made no complaint. He tipped his hat to the manager and said nothing to Walter as he left the field. There was nothing to say. Donovan came over to where Walter stood, and they watched as the Super Buzz went on practicing with a new pitcher. Walter couldn't help but notice they didn't make an error. I'm sorry, lad, Donovan said. It never would have worked. Even if the boys took to him, the other teams would have just walked off the field. He would have been the best pitcher on the whole team, and you know it, Walter said. Patsy Donovan didn't say anything to that. He didn't have to. Walter stared out the window of the train back to Coney Island without really seeing anything. It felt like there was a cloud in his brain fogging everything up. At Coney Island, he didn't head for the West Brighton Hotel or the Brighton Beach Hotel, but instead walked along the boardwalk with his head down and his hands buried in his pockets. Coney Island flashed and danced, but he wasn't watching. Fans played and preachers scolded, but he wasn't listening. Walter didn't even feel the wind off the water or the wood beneath his feet. At the end of the pier, Walter stood and stared out at the dark ocean, wondering what was at the bottom. When he was little, he had thought there was treasure there, Spanish gold or pirate plunder. Now he thought that maybe there wasn't anything down there, that it was a great empty pit of nothingness. Walter pulled off his beloved Brooklyn, Brooklyn Superba's hat and flung the thing as far out into the water as he could. He watched it splash down, then bob, then sink, settling in with the rest of the trash at the bottom of the great black sea.